So this is going to be a really short lecture on detoxification because, as we all know, if you talk to any MDs out there and listen to the mainstream media, detoxification is ridiculous, right? It's only practiced by quacks, and it's just complete nonsense. So that's that's my lecture on detoxification. Any questions? Uh, come on. You're all like me, right? You only breathe in oxygen, life-giving oxygen, fuel for our cells, and you never breathe out carbon dioxide, which is the waste product from catabolism of foods and nutrients. And you're like me, you never go to the toilet, right? You don't you eat food all day, but you never poop and pee, right? Because that's waste, that's the elimination of toxins. And we don't believe in detoxification. Or you're like me, you have a house and you bring stuff into the house, you bring in food, you get the mail and you get a newspaper and you buy stuff that's all wrapped up and you just take all of that trash and you leave it in your house, right? Yeah. Because you don't want to take out the trash. That would be like detoxing or something like weird like that. You know? So how have we come to this world where something as fundamental as detoxification has been sidelined into this sort of weird, you know, quackery, medical establishment, the media don't want to talk about it, they poo-poo it. How did we get to this stage? Um, I think one way to look at that is to, um, to look at this word. Uh oh, we got a pin problem. Uh, you should just throw that away so we can stop. Oh, yeah. I thought it was, I didn't know it was a pen. I thought it was a pen. Detox that pen. Uh, you know the origins? So. Yeah. You know the origins of this word? You know, this is what I've been called for 32 years that I've been practicing naturopathic medicine, is I'm referred to as a quack, or anybody who talks about herbs or detoxification or vitamins and minerals is basically relegated to this word. Well, I think it's always interesting to look at the derivation of words. Quack is actually a shorthand and forgive me, I don't speak German, so I'm probably slaughtering this, but for quackensolvent, mm -hmm. which is the German for quicksilver. And quicksilver was the common term for mercury, the metal mercury, which from around, four, from around 1500, 1550, up until 1900, was one of the most utilized medical prescriptions. If you went to an MD anywhere in the Western world, you were probably given mercury as a general tonic for whatever ailed you. Whether it was an infection, whether it was the malaise, whatever, a doctor would give you mercury. Uh, this became so prominent that by the time of the Civil War in the 1860s, they actually had some difficulty finding men to go and fight in the war because so many people had chronic mercury toxicity. <clears throat> so the MDs were prescribing mercury by the, by the late 1800s. This, this was still fairly popular, but it was starting to fall out of favor. And the doctors who were doing this started to be referred to as quacks. So I think this is an interesting distinction because Natural doctors never prescribed mercury. We believe in nurturing the body, not poisoning the body. But somehow this word got twisted around because we know who owns the media and who owns the drug companies is the people who control how our words are used. So we get turned this turned on us, even though we never use that. So you know, I made this silly little thing about breathing in and breathing out and going to the bathroom is sort of an illustration of well. Detoxification is a very basic thing. We know that all cultures in the world, everywhere, practice detoxification. Of course, they didn't understand the fineries of the science. They didn't know exactly why a certain herb or a certain um, plant or whatever 
did something positive for the body. But they sort of instinctively knew that you felt better if you went into a sauna or if you put mud packs on that you're learning how to do. Um, now, of course, we know a lot more about that science. But people instinctively knew this and practiced in all cultures of the world. So probably most famous is the sauna, right? Everybody kind of knows about saunas. We sort of associate those with Scandinavian countries. But actually, saunas are common throughout the world. Even in very hot climates, people do saunas. Uh, in Northwest, uh, temperate climate in the Northwest, the Native Americans here did uh, sweat lodges where they would build the little boughs and crawl into this and build a fire and get the heat going so they could sweat. Um, and then in preparation for that, they would actually lash themselves with nettles to open up their pores. You've all been stung by nettles and had that kind of stinging feeling. Well, that opens up your pores. And so they would kind of lash themselves with nettles and you go into these hot little things. Well, we're going to be doing that in just a few minutes. We're going to go outside. <laughs> just to wake you up a little bit. Um, so you know that detoxification has been around a really long time. But that doesn't particularly prove that it's useful. Um, what do we have to kind of say, well, if you were, if there was a problem with detoxification and you needed special doctors to do things about detoxification, wouldn't we be toxic? Well, the fact of the matter is we are toxic. And the literature, the scientific literature on this uh, is overwhelming, which is that we are all toxic. And and by this, I mean that every study that's ever been done um, on urine, on blood, on skin samples, on urine, uh, on mother's milk, all show they cannot find anybody that doesn't have toxic chemicals in their bodies. And this has been reported in such um, uh, avant-garde magazines as National Geographic and and Time Magazine. I mean, this is not questionable research. This is mainstream research outside the medical community. Once you go inside the medical community, it's weird and strange. But in the rest of science, it's very common knowledge that we're all toxic. And probably um, the most um, startling or eye-opening uh, study that was done about this, excuse me, was about um, uh, it was a breast milk sample study. So these researchers went and took breast milk from women all over the world. Yes, in New York City and Boston and places like that, but also in New Zealand, also in Mongolia, places that you don't necessarily consider all that toxic. And they could not find one sample that wasn't contaminated. And one of the researchers actually made a statement that if this was a new product and we were bottling this, and trying to sell it, we could not do it because it would not pass the EPA regulations. It's too toxic. So now that doesn't mean the women shouldn't be breastfeeding and there's really good arguments for breastfeeding, but I think it brings home this message that this is a really serious problem that we have. Um, so we're all toxic. Well, then you could say, well, so what? You know, we all got a little bit of these chemicals floating around in our bodies. But didn't you just say we already had all these detoxification mechanisms? I mean, you know, we got our liver and we've got pooping and breathing out. And we got all these things to help eliminate these toxins. Um, and to that, I would add genetics. You know, one of the very exciting things about the new opening up of the human genome is that we're able to look inside and see our genes that you know, maybe make estrogen or maybe make fibroid and do all of these really fundamentally important things for it. Well, there are probably more genes that code for detoxification than any other function of the body, which to me says that's really important. But you could also argue that, well, you got the genetics going for you, you got all this stuff, so so what if all of those toxins are out there? Our bodies are working on it. Well, that's where we come into the sort of historical perspective part of this. And to think, well, just like we talked about before, here we have uh, human evolution. And we could go back for a million years or whatever we want to go back. And we say, for most of our time span, we lived in the, quote, natural world. 
It wasn't until this little, you know, uh, eye blink of a snail uh, time 150 years ago that the science of synthetic chemistry started. That's when we started taking coal and oil and making different things out of it. So the first thing that we made was dyes. So before this, people got their dyes by uh, breaking up herbs or getting minerals or crushing bugs to get certain colors and dyeing their clothes. And you know, this is obviously a very laborious process and it was something that was basically only available for the rich people. Most of the rest of us had pretty bland clothing because of the price of, of this. So what happened was is that they developed this technique for taking coal tar and making dyes out of it. And now we have hundreds of thousands, even millions of these chemicals that have been derived since that time. Um, and these are all floating around in the atmosphere. Um, the first drug that was ever synthesized was aspirin. So the Bayer Company, the same company that you see on their little emblems, was the company that figured out how to take this natural substance, acetyl salicylic acid, which has been known about for hundreds of years as a cure for fever that you got from willow trees, and they made a synthetic version of it. And now, of course, we have thousands and thousands of drugs that have been synthesized from chemicals. Now, I'm not saying that just because something is synthesized is necessarily bad, but I am saying that it really changed everything. There was this huge change in our world not that long ago. Remember, 150 years ago, I was just a small boy, so it's not that long ago. And, and as we talked about when we talked about nutrition, this was also the huge time in the changes of our diet, right? So we had these two monumental things happening 150 years ago. We had this gigantic change in our diet from an organic uh, uh, kind of raised close to home foods, no pesticides and whatnot, to pesticides and processing and all of this that we know about has gone on with our food. And at the very same time, we had this introduction of these chemicals into our environment. So, Again, we talk about what does that mean, you know? So what? We're all toxic. We got this problem. Does that necessarily translate into things? And yeah, it translates into chronic diseases. How do I know it translates into chronic diseases? Well, you can look at it from a number of points of view. One of them is from the historical point of view. We have in, in 18 80s, very low incidences of all the diseases that we now consider common diseases. Diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, uh, digestive disorders, all of these things were relatively rare until this time, and now they're going up like this. So, uh, for instance, in 1900, the incidence of heart disease um, I think the statistic is for uh, Great Britain was about 4%. And now we're, we're honing in on 30 to 50% of the population having some kind of related heart disease. So we could look at that and say, well, maybe there's something to do with toxins having to do with that. I think that there's some evidence for that. The other way we could look at that is say, well, what do we know about these chemicals? Well, what we know about these chemicals, and we have a handout on this, is this whole inflammatory cycle. So we talk about that the research is very clear that inflammation is the core of all of our chronic diseases, whether it's heart disease, uh, whether it's diabetes, uh, whether it's digestive problems, whether it's asthma, um, whether it's joint problems and muscle problems, arthritic kinds of things, whether it's depression and mental things, whether it's weight gain, um, uh, bone loss, all of these sort of chronic conditions that we now consider fairly normal at their core have this core of inflammation. 
So what do we know uh, causes inflammation? Well, on your handout there, there's a little list at the bottom that lists all of the things that we know stimulate inflammation. And one of those is environmental toxins. One of them is uh, allergies, uh, like food allergies. One of them is poor digestion. One of them is uh, trauma. So you're reading about this all the time, about how somebody undergoes a really traumatic event, and this creates problems mentally, physically in their body. And that's because it's stimulating inflammation. Um, and we also have genetic, it's not on your sheet there because I haven't added it, but genetics also feed in this inflammatory cycle. Some people have genetics that are just more prone towards inflammation, um, but we can change that. So my point being that we have some pretty interesting evidence here that we know environmental toxins increase inflammation, and we know inflammation increases all of these chronic diseases. So there's another little piece of evidence that says, gosh, maybe there's something to this whole thing about detoxification and toxins bothering us. Uh, another piece of evidence we have is that when you detoxify people, you get amazing results. Now, I know this isn't uh, mainstream medicine, but it's coming in more and more where people are taking people with heart disease, with cancer, with diabetes, and putting them on scientifically based detoxification programs. I'm not talking about uh, just having somebody drink a herbal tea. I'm talking about scientifically based where they're taking in the nutrients that help the detoxification cycle, which we're going to talk about again in, in just a second. Um, we know that doctors who are doing this get amazing results from these chronic diseases. Um, one example of this is um, there is a former Air Force surgeon who's now cre uh, treating a lot of soldiers um, who had uh, uh, Gulf War syndrome. And we know that war uh, is one of the biggest toxifiers of our environment. We got all sorts of contamination that gets spread out when we have war and armies. And so these soldiers were coming back and they had all these weird symptoms that first were denied by the medical establishment and thinking, well, this is just all in your mind. And now gradually have been, you know, legitimized and say, okay, now we will accept this and we'll call it, you know, Gulf War Syndrome. Well, the doctor who's having the most success with these people is the person who's detoxing these people, getting all of these toxins out of their body. And I could give many examples of this, but there's there's lots of stuff out there supporting this idea that you start detoxing, you start getting people better. You can also look at this from the other point of view, which is you look at certain diseases like diabetes, like heart disease, and you say, well, is there anything in the scientific literature that says that toxins can cause this? And yes, there is. If you have any doubt about this, just go home and Google any disease you can think of, whatever your favorite disease is, um, <laughs> Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, whatever, and say Parkinson's and lead, or Parkinson's and just toxins in general, or Parkinson's and plastics. Um, you're going to get a whole bunch of uh, research that has been done on that. Again, this is research that's in the scientific community, but is being barricaded from the medical community. So we have a lot of good evidence that this stuff is actually having an effect on our body and it's causing these chronic diseases. Um, so what do we do about it? So before we talk about that, I want to talk about your other hand out there just for a second to give you kind of a, an overview of this. So this is the idea that we live in a world where there are millions of these new to nature chemicals that were invented over the last 150 years. So we have air pollution and water pollution and food pollution. And now with the food pollution would include hormones, it would include uh, pesticides, but it would also include foods that you were allergic to. Uh, we know stress causes toxic chemicals to be released in our body. We know that infections 
we're using the broadest sense of this word toxin where we want to include all of the forms of toxins and certainly infection, bacteria, viruses, fungal and things, those are all toxins to our body. Um, we also know that anybody who has um, digestive problems because they're not breaking down their food readily, they're creating more gas and fermentation, they're going to be creating more toxins in their body. We know that people who are taking any kind of medication are going to have a certain toxic substance in their body. Um, an analogy of this would be, here is a four-lane highway and you're using three of those lanes just to get by. That's your normal metabolism that uses up three lanes just to get by. And all of a sudden you start trying to merge a bunch of other cars onto this highway that have air pollution, water pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And so suddenly this, this, this uh, highway is going to get bogged down and not going to work very efficiently, right? Well, that's the same thing that happens in our liver. Because you can think of these you can think of all of this like a huge funnel, sideways funnel, and it's going into our liver. So the liver, detoxification happens in every cell in your body, by the way. Every cell has a mechanism for getting rid of the waste that it doesn't need. But the major organ for detoxification is the liver. So the liver, you can sort of think about this um, sort of simplistically as a big conveyor belt, right? And you're eating and you're breathing and all these things are coming into your body. But what's happening is that there's this conveyor belt and then there's these inspectors there and they're inspecting everything on the conveyor belt. And they're saying, oh, that's vitamin A, that's great stuff, we're gonna keep that, but that's plastic or that's lead or that's mercury, let's get rid of that. And so the liver is primarily responsible for sorting all of this stuff out, uh, among other functions that it does. What does the liver need to do this? Well, there's certain <clears throat> vitamins that we know helps the liver work better. There's minerals, there's antioxidants, there's certain amino acids. These things have all been researched and found that they actually help the liver do a better job. Um, one example of this that you probably have heard of, of many of you have heard of milk thistle. So if you go into a health food store or someplace, you're going to and ask for a detox formula. Often it will have milk thistle in it. It might have dandelion and other herbs in it, but milk thistle is a pretty common one. So these are these big thistles that you see growing sometimes. I mean, these plants can be huge, and if you actually let them grow to full maturity and go to seeds, they produce seeds that are comparable in size to sunflower seeds. I mean, they could be quite large in the right circumstances. Well, people knew that these seeds were good for detoxification. Again, they didn't really understand why, but they, you know, they'd been around and people had been using them. So in the 1980s, some people decided to do some research on this. So what they did was they took two groups of mice. One, they fed a normal diet, Cap, you know, mouse chalk kind of stuff. And the other they fed the normal diet, but they gave them extra miles of milk thistle. Then they took these two groups and they exposed them to a chemical that generally causes liver cancer in 100% of the animals that it is exposed to. So they exposed these mice, and the mice that had just uh, eaten a normal diet all died. But interestingly enough, the ones that had been given the milk thistle didn't all die. I don't remember the exact numbers, but a, a fair number of those survived because they had the protective effect of this milk thistle. So we can look into this and get into the biochemistry of it, but basically plants have antioxidants. You've all heard that term. You've heard uh, antioxidants associated with the latest, greatest uh, imported food from some place that claims to be the most high in antioxidants of any other food. Well, all foods have antioxidants in them. And the truth of the matter is, is that there are actually dozens or even hundreds of antioxidants, and they all work in different areas of the body. So, milk thistle happens to have some antioxidants that work particularly well in the liver. You may have heard of people using uh, an herb for vision. 
Well, that's because it has antioxidants that are particularly good for eyesight, and et cetera, et cetera. So we're beginning to unravel some of the science underneath why these things actually work. So what will happen is, is the liver will sort through these things, and then ideally, it puts things out through the gallbladder and through the bowels, and some of it will also go out through the uh, blood um, and go to kidneys and the skin. So we have a number of ways to eliminate all of this. One distinction I'd like to make, because I think there's a lot of confusion in the field about this, is that this here, the bowels, the kidneys, the skin, this is elimination. Sometimes called uh, phase three of detoxification, sometimes called um, um, uh, other things. But the idea being that that's the third phase. That's where things are eliminated from the body. But detoxification is actually happening in the liver. And so what I mean by confusion, you'll know, sometimes uh, see a product or see somebody talking about, oh yeah, I did a detox. And what it involved was taking a bunch of fiber and a laxative or maybe doing something else to speed up my bowels. But what they were doing was working on this third phase on elimination. They weren't really working on this phase on the detoxification portion of things. And I think it's an important distinction because these get confused. This cleansing, I did a cleanse. Well, cleansing would be down here, detoxification would be here. They're related to each other, but they're actually different systems. So what happens, you know, here's the, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, is if you have too many toxins or not enough of the nutrients that your liver needs to do its work, what happens to these toxins? Well, the body doesn't like these things roaming around inside of it, right? It wants to, doesn't like you to have plastics and solvents and stuff going in your bloodstream and contaminating stuff, so it sequesters it. And where this goes is generally into fat cells. So your fat cells become little depositories of these toxins as a way to try to protect you. And yes, some of us have some body fat that helps us do that. Um, uh, some of us have a brain and a nervous system. Remember, a brain and nervous system, 70% fat, right? Some of us have hormones. So you're talking estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, and stress hormones. Those are all made from fat. And then, as you know, there's a fair amount of fat on the skin. So what happens when a person is not eliminating these toxins very well? Well, they'll manifest down here in some very general kind of symptoms. You know, you can have acne, you can have psoriasis, you can have hormone disruption. Um, a woman won, uh, I think it was a Nobel Prize for discovering that plastics actually interfere with estrogen. And we're talking here about the plastics that come from soft plastic bottles that are actually good. <laughs> so we know that she has very little estrogen. <laughs> um, we know that people will talk about neurological problems when they're when they have toxins in their body. They will talk about depression, they'll talk about poor sleep, they'll talk about the nerves going to the blood vessels going up so the blood pressure goes up. They'll talk about having poor sleep. Um, I've seen patients that have like arsenic poisoning will get like numbness and tingling in their fingers. Um, so my point being that there's a lot of different kinds of symptoms and it can be kind of hard to narrow it down just like symptoms um, on what's going on with a person. This makes it very difficult, by the way, to lose fat. Um, if you think about a person, here's um, a 200 pound person who has uh, 10 pounds of toxins in them, and that's, you know, that's not a wild number. On, on average, we all eat about eight pounds of pesticides every year. Uh, or somebody's getting my percentage there. 
So what if that person loses 100 pounds and now they're 100 pounds and they don't detoxify? Well, they still have 10 pounds of toxins in their body. So what they've done is concentrate these toxins. Their body doesn't like that. So their body's response is going to be, well, if you're not going to get rid of this stuff, uh, put on some more weight. And so you go back up in weight to try to dilute this stuff. Um, the body is um, uh, uh, always trying to dilute toxins. And you've, you've maybe had this experience where you've had too much alcohol, maybe you never do this, but so you might have talked to somebody who's done this. You drink too much alcohol and the next morning you feel all bloated and puffy. Well, that's your water, that's your body holding in water to try to dilute the alcohol and the aldehydes and things, the metabolic uh, byproducts of that alcohol. It's trying to spare you those toxins. Our body is always trying to dilute the stuff and if it can't get rid of it, dilute it in some way. Um, so that's your overall mechanism of what's going on here. If, you know, we could get, again, you know, go into some more detail. I think one really interesting, not to bore you too much with this, one interesting little detail of this is that the liver actually has two phases. There's phase one and there's phase two and then there's over here with phase three. Well, phase one, you can think of um, the inspectors inside the liver. They're watching this conveyor belt going by and they're seeing stuff. Well, every time they see something toxic, they take their little magic marker and put a little mark on it to tell the um, second part of the liver that this is toxic stuff. You better get rid of this right away. So obviously the liver doesn't have little magic markers. What it does is it adds a chemical. So think of this, this is the toxic chemical that's going through your liver. And the inspector puts a little chemical onto that. And that's what is alerting part two of your liver that, hey, this is really toxic stuff and we need to get rid of it. So what's fascinating about this is that this is actually more toxic than this. In other words, your, your original toxin wasn't so great for you, but this is really bad for you in many cases. And you think, well, why would the body do that? Well, for millions of years, the body was very efficient in getting rid of that, so it didn't matter that it was more toxic. Because part two of detoxification worked so well that it could just get rid of it. Well, now we've disrupted all of this. Now we have poor functioning, both stage one and stage two of detoxification. So we've got more toxins, and we have even more toxic toxins in our bodies than, than we would have normally. Um, so uh, that's kind of the overview. I want to talk, in just a minute, I want to sort of talk some practicality because people are going to be coming to you and they're going to be talking about, you know, what do I do? Or I'm doing this detox, and what do you think of this detox and whatnot? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. I just want to say a word here about um, bad treatments. So, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, and there's books that are being written about this, and you can, you know, you can't swing a cat without hitting somebody that has an idea about how to detox the body. And I think you've got to be very, very careful with this, because for one thing, most people who are talking and don't have any kind of scientific background, they don't really understand this process very well, and like I said earlier, they're just talking about stage three. The other thing is that they often propose some um, things that could actually waste your money and possibly even do you real harm. And so let's talk about a couple of examples. One example of this is um, um, there's a popular diet, a popular de detox diet. Maybe you've heard of, have any of you heard of the um, Master Cleanse? See, if you go on the website, there's books about this, and it's been around for 20 years or so. 
the master cleanse and there's variations on this, but basically it says to detoxify, you drink this uh, water that has a little cayenne pepper in it, it's a little honey in it, um, and that's all you have. You don't have any food, and you're drinking this stuff all day, and you're going to help pull these toxins out of your body. And like I say, there's variations on that. Sometimes they use lemon juice or apple juice or whatever, but the idea being that you're basically fasting. Um, so doesn't that sound good? I mean, you know, you're going to clean your body out. You're not going to take any nutrients in. And, um, so that's potentially good, right? You're going to be you're going to be breaking down these fat cells that have all these toxins in them. So that's good. Well, invariably, if you talk to anybody who's ever done the master cleanse, they'll say, "Oh yeah, I did that, and I felt terrible." Um, so it must have been good for me, right? Uh, you know, I got a rash, I felt sick, I couldn't hardly walk, uh, and I got headaches. Well, to me, that's a sign that the detox is not working. That you're actually not getting this stuff out of the body, that you're just recycling it. You're maybe moving it from your brain to your skin or from your spat to your hormones or something like that. You're shifting things about, and you're not really getting rid of it. And if you think about the mechanism here, it really makes sense because if you're fasting, so just drinking this single liquid all day, you're breaking down fat cells, that's going to release a tremendous amount of toxins into your body because you're, that's where they're all stored, right? So they're going to go to your liver, but you're not eating, you're not giving your liver the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acids, and the things that it needs to do its work. So instead of moving them out like it's supposed to, it just recycles them back into your body. Um, and this, the same, my same analogy would go for just fasting in general. There are people out there who propose that we should fast to do a detox. And um, I guess what I would say about this is this is sort of a more nuanced answer in, the, in that Yes, people have done fasting for thousands of years as part of their detoxing regimes. And so we know that there's a history for that. We know that people spill out toxins when they fast. That's really well established. My reason for being against fasting, unless you're under the supervision of a trained person, is that you're creating this huge load on your liver all of these new to nature chemicals. Because remember, our, our livers learn to do its job in the natural world. That's when the genetics and the enzymes and all this stuff helping us develop this detoxification system was put into effect. So the liver doesn't necessarily do that great of a job with drugs, you know, prescription drugs, solvents, pesticides, and stuff that's off-gassing from this carpet coming in from the plastics that are all around us. You know, new car smell, everybody loves new car smell. It has like 83 different chemicals in it, and I, I would say probably none of them are natural chemicals. So we're getting exposed to these new-to-nature chemicals, and the liver doesn't necessarily know what to do with them or do a great job of getting rid of them. And that's why I'm against fasting as a general rule, I, I, I know that there's some doctors out there who would be a great success with it, and I think if they're supervising people, uh, that's probably okay. Um, but as a general, I don't suggest that people do this on their own. I suggest that they do some things that are supporting their liver's detoxification pathways. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about some other bad treatments. So, in addition to fasting, or the master cleanse that I think are not so great. We also have some, some kind of hokey kind of things out there. One of them is, have you heard of the water uh, foot baths? No. So there are people out there, spas, sometimes doctors, who have these little baths that you put your feet in. And then they plug it in and there's an electrolysis kind of thing that happens and they claim that this will actually pull toxins from your body. And their proof is that the water is all black when you finish doing this. Well, when I was setting up to do detoxification in my practices, um, I basically was open to everything. I was saying, okay, I'm going to do detoxification. Let's find out where the best science is. Let's see what will work the best for people. 
And these the people who were selling these gizmos for doing the foot baths came to me and they said, oh, look at all this and look how dirty this water is. And uh, uh, we have these testimonials of these people saying they feel better. And I said, great, that's great. Where is the scientific literature that says, here's a person before and here's a person after? You know, this isn't rocket science, right? You test the amount of chemicals in somebody and you do the foot bath or whatever else you're gonna do. And then you test them again. And the more people you do this on, the better the science, right? It's pretty straightforward. Well, they could never produce this information for me. There was just no studies done. And, you know, they're making lots of money off these machines. Why don't they pay for some, some science? So this went on for a couple of decades. And you see these machines around. Well, finally, somebody did do some research. The Canadian College of um, Naturopathic Medicine did a study. And their conclusion was that not only do these devices not remove toxins from your body, they actually drive toxins into your body. So stay away from the foot pads. Um, another one you might see if you've, uh, I've never seen this, but I'm told about it. If you stay up for late night TV, there are pads that you put on the mm -hmm. bottom of your feet. Mm -hmm. yeah, now we know who the insomniacs are. <laughs> <laughs> so they put these pads and again, oh, they turn black. That must mean you're pulling all this stuff out of your body. And again, you know, it's like, okay, you know, maybe it works. It doesn't really make sense, but you know, show me some evidence. No evidence at all. Um, I, and I'm told that there's actually a YouTube video where they take one of these pads and they just steam it over a, a, a teapot and it turns black. <laughs> so um, I doubt if those are really doing anything. Uh, but it does bring up this idea that whenever anybody's talking to you about anything, especially about detoxification, you know, you know there is scientific information out there. You don't have to just guess. Um, the last one I wanted to talk about, and this is kind of controversial too, is colonics. Any of you know what colonics are? So colonics are basically like super enemas. They take a bunch of water and they flush it through your bowels. And what they're claiming is, is they're flushing all of these toxins out of your body. And um, so again, we, we try to apply some logic to this and we go, okay, do you have any scientific evidence? Well, I've never been able to find any evidence. I found some evidence that it helps people with chronic, uh, uh, really horrible constipation. That doesn't really mean that it's helping them detoxify um, because you're only working on phase three if you're flushing out the bowel, right? And not working here. Um, so what else might this be doing? Um, well, you can imagine a lot of water going in. If the equipment isn't cleaned properly, it could introduce bad stuff into your bowels. And there have been a few cases of that. Um, you could also imagine that while the bowel is a, a stretchable muscle and we're putting all this fluid into it, maybe it's expanding expanding, maybe it's actually distending the colon and making it less efficient over time. Um, again, I don't have any evidence that it does that, but they don't have any evidence that it doesn't. They claim that it doesn't, but they don't have any evidence. They say it firms up the bowel, makes it work more efficiently, but I don't see that. Um, and the last thing that pisses me off about them the most is that um, they claim that we have layers and layers of sludge inside of our bowels. What? And they show these drawings of the inside of a bowel and you know inches and inches of sludge in there that the only way to get this stuff out of there is to flush it out. Well, this is completely absurd. This is a, a myth that somebody created and it's just gotten perpetuated and has no basis in reality. If you had that kind of layers of sludge inside your bowels, you would die. And the other thing we know is that gastroenterologists that do colonoscopies and actually look with a camera, they don't see this. Um, so the likelihood of it really existing is, is pretty remote. Um, now, are some people constipated? Yes. Um, I think it's very, very important that people move their bowels three times a day. That's kind of rare. 
that that's what our human physiology says we should be doing. This is what human population studies that look at people's health say that we should be doing. They look at people and they say, people who are constipated or only have a one bowel movement, they have more hemorrhoids, more gallbladder disease, more acne, all sorts of medical problems. We also know that physiologically, when we eat, it stretches the stomach, that sends a message to our brain, it sends a message to our bowels that says, start moving. So theoretically, you know, and in practical purposes, we should be having bowel movements three times a day. And this is a really important part of the process. But again, it still isn't detoxification. You gotta work on these things together. Um, so anyway, I'm against uh, colonics. Um, so let's talk, um, let's talk a little bit about some practical things, because I don't want to make this all theoretical, because like I said, people are going to be coming to you. So let's talk about, um, actually, let's not. Let's talk about, I think an interesting exercise is to say, well, what can we do on a very practical level to detoxify? Because I hope I've established this idea that we should all be detoxifying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we want to be maximizing our ability to do that. So how can we do that? And let's start with the, uh, the really easy or free things that we could be doing to help us detoxify. Any of you have any ideas? So I think the one that comes up the most commonly is water. You know, we know that water helps the liver. All chemical processes in the water in the body work better when there's enough fluid to make the action happen. When cells are dehydrated, they're less efficient. Uh, we also know that the kidneys need that water to flush stuff out. Um, how much water? Subject to debate. You know, the rule of thumb is eight to ten glasses a day, or one half of your body weight uh, in, in liters, right, excuse me, in ounces. So that would be a 150 pound person for 75 ounces of water a day. Um, there's amazingly very little research done on this because there's no money in water. Um, and nobody wants to kind of do this kind of study. There's nothing to patent, nothing to sell. But we can, we can get a pretty good idea from just studies and testing people's hydration levels. Um, one thing that I do to all of my patients is I have a special scale that I have them stand on when they come into my office. And the scale, of course, does their weight, but it also does their percentage of water. So we can find out whether a person is dehydrated and then suggest that they have more water. It also tells the percentage of fat, percentage of muscle, abdominal uh, fat and things like that. So now that I got the ball rolling, um, what else would you say would be really simple things to tell people to do in terms of basic detoxification? You know this word. It's fiber. Fiber is um, really important downstream here in terms of pulling toxins out of your body. Um, what fiber, you know, people kind of, oh, fiber, it's just this sort of inactive stuff. But fiber is actually grabbing on to things and helping to pull them out of your body. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this, but a few years back, there was this huge study done and, and uh, published in major medical journals about how oatmeal lowers cholesterol. And uh, there was actually so much to do about this article that they were, there were editorials written to doctors saying, giving fiber is just as effective as giving drugs. Well, that lasted a little while, and though those people were sort of shut up uh, in favor of the drug people. But how does that work? Like, why would oatmeal lower cholesterol? Well, when you've got the liver, produces bile in the gallbladder. And when you eat fats, it secretes the bile into the intestines that help you digest things. Then it moves through your bowel. Well, if there's fiber there, 
it will grab onto this file and help move it out. Will bile, a large constituent of bile is cholesterol. So it's grabbing onto this and saying, hey, let's get rid of this right away. We don't like all of this sludge hanging around. Let's, let's get it out of our body. Um, that's why it's always a bad idea to have your gallbladder taken out. I wouldn't say always a bad idea, but often a bad idea. <laughs> oh, yeah, somebody just had that done. <laughs> so, what else? Come on, you can help me here. What else would happen that would help this process? Pardon me? Whole foods. Yeah, whole foods. Because why are whole foods going to have in them? They're going to have more vitamins, more minerals, more antioxidants, all of these things that we know help with detoxification. So a whole food diet is going to have more fiber in it. It's going to have uh, more vitamins, and minerals, and antioxidants, and all of these things that we know help the liver do its job. Um, it, this might not be as obvious to you, but you may have seen the research or heard along the way about research that talks about how broccoli and cruciferous vegetables are really uh, good at lowering your incidence of cancer. So when I graduated from medical school 32 years ago, the line of the American Cancer Society was that diet has nothing whatsoever to do with cancer. Now they've become a little more enlightened and they will say, oh, it looks like cruciferous vegetables are of some help with cancer. And actually they're of great help with cancer. And um, they have uh, some various chemicals in them that basically aid the liver's ability to take toxins out of the body. So the cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli and the cabbages and all that kind of stuff, are which are traditional foods that were eaten in all cultures, um, are really, really good for this whole detoxification process. Um, another one you may not be as quite as obvious with uh, is beans. Uh, beans have a lot of different kinds of beans, have a lot of antioxidants in them, they have a lot of fiber in them, and they have a lot of sulfur in them. Sulfur is one of the main constituents of this detoxification pathway. So sulfur, coincidentally, high in beans, high in broccoli, high in onions, garlic, all of those things that you keep hearing about as being really good for us, they all have that thing in common, being very high in sulfur. So the sulfur-containing foods. The World Health Organization published a study showing that, um, and forgive me, I don't know exactly the numbers here, but if you ate beans, I think it was three times a week, a half a cup or something like that, you reduce your chances of cancer by as much as 60%, depending on the kind of cancer. Like some kinds of cancer it reduced it by 20%, some kinds of cancer it was by 60%. So really interesting uh, research on just you know simple things like beans and how because they affect this detoxification pathway, they really do for it. Okay, I won't pester you about this anymore. Let's get into your specialty. What can you tell people in terms of your work that would help them detoxify? More mud. <laughs> Pardon me? More mud. That's all right. Um, have you heard of the more oxygen mud? Oh, more mud. Yeah, yes. More mud. So, <laughs> uh, 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 I'm sorry, I was blanking out there. So, yeah, any kind of skin treatment that does a number of things will help you detoxify. So, you're talking about clays and muds of various kinds that, again, have been for hundreds of years, people have applied these things to the body found that it pulls out toxins and makes them feel better. Uh, again, we get back into what we talked about earlier, saunas, anything that heats up the skin, it gets more circulation to the skin. So here we're talking about really exotic things to do like exercise. <laughs> um, anything that gets your circulation going, gets you sweating, 
uh, massage. Well, the massage helps you get the circulation going. It, it stimulates the lymphatic system that helps drain stuff away from the skin. All of these things are really good at detoxifying. And of course, you're learning how to do that kind of stuff, and you're seeing the differences in pulling out these toxins on their skin and making a difference in things like acne and psoriasis and whatnot. So, any, anything else you can think of? I think you covered it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there are some more specific things, and, and I, I, um, I guess the easiest way to talk about this is just to kind of say what I do. So when somebody comes to me and they want to do a detox, or I you know, uh, challenge them to do a detox, um, the program that I use is basically one word. There's a couple of components to it. One of them is, is that I'll have them drink a supplemental diet. And the reason for the supplemental diet, it's a, it's a powder, um, it's got protein in it, also been fortified with all of these things that the liver needs to do its work better. Um, so there's some amino acid in there. And we'll have them start slow and build up because we don't want to overstimulate the liver to be too much too fast because we don't want to have a negative reaction, right? So I'll have them do this once a day for a few days and then I'll have them murder twice a day and then three times a day and then do that for three weeks. The question always comes up there as well, do they eat anything? And yes, what I help people do is eat a whole food diet, um, drink lots of water, eat lots of vegetables, because the shakes have protein in them, they don't have to worry about protein as much, but they're certainly uh, able to eat protein, but we want them to eat organic proteins. Um, and the other component that I have people do, especially if they have any mystery about whether they have food allergies, I'll have them do an elimination diet. Because remember, on our list of things that are toxic for the body, uh, besides chemicals and stress and whatnot, are foods that you're allergic to. Those are toxic to your body. So some people choose to, during a detox, to actually do an elimination diet and not eat the most commonly allergic foods. Um, and the most commonly allergic foods are? Soy. Wheat, corn, soy, dairy, eggs, um, peanuts. Um, I mean, you know, you can be allergic to rutabagas, but those are kind of the most common things. So I'll have people not eat those during this time, and then substitute other grains for wheat. Maybe they're going to eat more rice, maybe they're going to eat more quinoa or something like that. Um, and um, it sort of does two things at the same time. On the one hand, it eliminates toxins coming in, but it helps educate them. And so a lot of people come out of this thinking, Wow, I never realized how badly X affected me, you know, wheat or corn or whatever. Um, and I've heard the story thousands of times. And some people say, I felt great during that detox. I felt really good. You know, I was going to work. My work day was good. I was waking up with more energy. Um, everything was going well. But then there was this party at work or, you know, you know life came along. And they just couldn't resist having some wheat or some dairy or maybe both. Um, and then they say, oh my God, the next day I just felt terrible. I woke up with one of my migraines. Or I woke up with you know, my skin, which has been clearing up, was worse. Or my depression, which had lifted, had gotten worse. Um, <laughs> my favorite story about this, I had this patient a number of years ago um, who was a self-described bitch. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't call her that. She called herself that. She said she was really obnoxious. She worked with these people that all just thought she was a horrible person. So she goes on this detox, and what she came back and described to me was, I felt fantastic. In the first two weeks of this detox, I felt so good. And one of my employees came up to me and said, are you taking Prozac? Oh. You are just so happy and different than you normally are. And she said, no, no, I'm just doing this diet. Well, and she, like many other people, you know, we all make mistakes and life comes along. So 
after two weeks of feeling fantastic and having lost all of her bitchiness, she ate some wheat and just spiraled downhill for the next 24 hours and feeling horrible and being cranky at work and you know, alienating all of her employees. So this is the kind of thing you'll have somebody do this detox program, watch and see how much better they feel. And then if they feel like they're reacting to a food, go back, you know, slowly uh, avoid that food or, or change their diet in such a way that they're not having that kind of exposure anymore. But this works really, really well as a way to you know, kind of eliminate the toxins and get people feeling well and doing it in a fairly combined period of time. Like I we chose three weeks somewhat arbitrarily just because well, most people can commit to doing something for three weeks. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I can do this for three weeks. Then they see how much better they feel. And then they go, oh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe I should start avoiding that. Or maybe I should start doing some detoxification on an ongoing basis. Because that's really the key. You know, doing a heavy-duty detox is really important for a lot of people, especially people who are very, very sick. They get great results. But if you're not really, really sick, you may not have to go to that extreme. But what you can do right now is just start initiating this idea that I'm exposed to toxins every day. So what am I going to do to help my body get rid of these things? I can't move out to the mountains and live in a hut. I'm going to be exposed to these things. So I'm going to drink water, I'm going to eat organic foods, I'm going to lower the incidence of toxins coming in, I'm going to eat whole foods, I'm going to do these things that I know help me. Um, there's another whole category. We talked about the things that you could do that were positive. The other whole category is the avoidance. So the avoidance is well, do you want to use an uh, uh, air filter in your house? And there's some very humid, uh, not very expensive air filters that will help clean out some of the toxins. There are now available water filters for getting water out. Now, we live in a great part of the country where we don't have a big problem with our water. There are a lot of places in the country that have very bad water. Um, but you can get the kind that you put on your sink and you turn it on and you get it right out of the faucet. And that way, you get to avoid plastic containers um, uh, and you don't add to the landfill if you're getting it directly out of the thing and then the alternative to the soft plastic is metal or the harder plastics or some other kind of way of carrying the water around um, another big thing is of course the toxins that you have in your house and one of the really interesting things is we know that solvents and pesticides and these strong industrial cleansers that we have in our house, um, flea bombs, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that we all have in our homes, or a lot of people have in their homes. Where do we keep them? Most people keep them under the sink. Where do you spend most of your time? Over your kitchen sink or near your toilet sink? So all of this stuff is off-gassing to you and getting in your face every day whenever you're around that. So the number one thing you should do is, of course, stop buying those products. But the number two thing you should do is, if you do have those products, is put them in a tight container and preferably take them out of your immediate surroundings. Put them in the garage, put them in the basement, put them someplace so they're not in your face every day. Um, because we know that even though we don't see it, the stuff is off the acid and getting into our bodies, and that's why we're all toxic. So, avoidance goes a long ways. And I think that that is the end. Any questions? What was so you kind of explained phase one of the liver detoxifying process, but what was phase two? So phase two, so phase one, remember, adds this chemical compound onto the toxin. Phase two then recognizes that compound and says, ah, that stuff is bad. 
I need to get rid of it. I need to exclude it right away. And that, and then it sends it to stage three, which is the elimination or the cleansing sort of portion of things. And that's what water and fiber and all of these things do. Are lentils considered bean lentils? Yes. So you have like kidney beans, black beans. Yeah. What about barley? Oh, that's well, barley's a grain. That's a grain. Oh, yeah. And the, the, well, and of course, grains are high generally in fiber also, uh, but they don't have the sulfur component that beans have. Them. Not that grains aren't good in their own right, too. Yeah. Uh, there's this like cleanser that's on it, and it's like a plastic water limit or like water is used. Where you just drink that water yes. and, you, and do those actually work? Well, that's basically the master cleanse that somebody yeah. packaged in another way. <laughs> so the problem there, again, is that you're fasting, you're breaking down these fats, you're releasing these toxins really rapidly, and you're overloading your uh, liver. And so you're more likely to have a bad reaction to that kind of a toxic effect. Is it were they, were they were they saying that it helps you lose weight, or is this just like a like the client, like yeah. detox and like for weight? And, and and I would say that what's happening there again is that they're not giving you anything to support your liver, and so what's happening is the toxins are just moving from one area to the other. There's no there's I wouldn't say there's no, but there's little evidence that those kind of things work. Now, a lot of people have very bad reactions to them. They have headaches and migraines and have negative feelings. Uh, one of the, you always want to be aware of any kind of a diet that says you're going to lose more than three pounds in a week. If they're saying you're going to lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds, or whatever in some short period of time, then they're causing dehydration and protein and muscle loss. And biochemically, pretty much can only lose about three pounds of fat per week. So that's why we put people on the scale and measure their muscle and their fat and we say, okay, let's make sure these people are actually losing fat and not muscle because if you're losing muscle and water, you're just going to regain that weight plus more later on. So, no, I wouldn't recommend that. Okay. You have any questions? Yeah. So, I really want to add something, some sort of supplement to my diet. I went to CVS the other day and I got kind of overwhelmed with all the different vitamins that they have. I'm just wondering what a good vitamin is for digestion. Well, you know, this is a kind of a controversial area. There's people who say, well, uh, we shouldn't need supplements if we're eating well. Um, and well, it's hard to eat while well, you're just like on the go all the time. Exactly. Yeah, like food. how many people have three meals a day, have the recommended five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables, um, have good digestion to make sure they're processing that. It's very hard to get a quote good diet. We also know um, from that statistic I told you last time from the United States Department of Agriculture that our food is 30 to 50 percent. Uh, lower in vitamins and minerals than it was just 50 years ago because of the soil depletion. So I think there's a lot of good evidence that we should be supplementing something along with our diets. <clears throat> now, how do you make the decision? Well, I think one of them is, you know, do you have health problems? You know, if you are, are diabetic and obese and have all sorts of health problems, you really need to seek professional help and get really good guidance. If you're still healthy and you're just talking about, oh, what can I do to make sure that I don't end up like that person, uh, then you want to go with a good multivitamin. Now, what's a good multivitamin? Um, that gets into a whole topic of discussion, but um, one thing, a good, any good multivitamin or any kind of vitamin or supplement should have a GMP sticker on it, which means good manufacturing practices. This is an independent um, testing of a vitamin. So if you've seen the reports that say 
University of Washington went into a health food store and bought a bunch of supplements and they tested them and found that 80% of them don't have an enema, they say, or the New York Times did the same thing, 60 Minutes did the same thing. Well, that's because nobody's really overseeing these vitamin companies very well. And this is a, a big blight on the industry. GMP standards are those companies saying, we're going to step up to it and we're going to do the best we can do and we're going to even take our vitamins and we're going to send them out to an independent lab and have them test it and make sure it actually has in it what we say it has in it. And it's very complicated and there's all sorts of segments to that, but that's kind of basically what it is, is saying these are the best quality vitamins. So I wouldn't buy any vitamin that wasn't GMP certified. Um, Secondly, one thing you want to look for is, you know, extra stuff. You know, uh, does it have dyes? Does it have chemicals? Is there a lot of words on the label that you don't understand? Um, you know, is it vitamin D? But then there's, on the label it says vitamin D, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, does that make sense? Shouldn't it just have vitamin D in it? Um, uh, one of my least favorite brands and I love Costco for other things but the Kirkland brands have all sorts of garbage in there and you just see this list of things um, that people shouldn't be taking into their bodies. So you want to avoid that kind of stuff, colorings and whatnot. Three, you know, I, I think the place to start is a multivitamin. Um, you want to get of course A and D and E and your zinc and your selenium, and those will all be on the label, and you'll, you'll see how much is in there. I think one of the things that gets lost or it gets um, missed by a lot of people is the B vitamin content. A lot of these supplements have very low amounts of these, and you know, why are the B vitamins helpful? Because you just said, you know, we're under stress, we're busy, we're got complicated lives. B vitamins help with the nervous system, help with the adrenal system, help us deal with stress. So I generally look for ones that have like 10 milligrams or more of B vitamins. And one of the things you're going to see in any kind of multivitamin is there's not going to be enough calcium and magnesium in there. It's literally, the pill would be too big. Calcium and magnesium are big molecules. You couldn't put them in there in most cases in sufficient amounts. The other thing is, is that you can sort of <clears throat> roughly think of this as the vitamins are in the morning. They're giving you energy. They're vital. The minerals, the calcium, the magnesium are relaxing. You want to take those and you need them. So this is a common mistake that I see people is not taking their supplements at the right time. So you'd want to take a multivitamin and then if you felt like you needed more calcium and magnesium to do that in the evening. Um, then you go, okay, well, what else? Well, we live in a world where there's this huge amount of vitamin D deficiency. And um, this, of course, is in the northern climates, but even in the south where people have a lot of sun, they spend all day inside, you know, in their air conditioning, they're not getting enough vitamin D. Um, for 30 some years, we have known that vitamin D has very wide effects in the body. You know, for years, all doctors would talk about, so vitamin D, that's for your bones. Uh, yeah, take a little bit. But the evidence has been there that it helps the immune system, it helps the hormone system. Your, your, uh, your um, thyroid can't work unless it has some vitamin D to help it do its job. So how much D do you need? Well, ideally what you do is you get tested. Vitamin D is one of the few vitamins that you can take that you can actually get a fairly accurate reading from the blood test about where you are. And so this idea that, well, everybody should be taking 2,000 milligrams is, is ludicrous in life. That, well, what if, you're, if the normal is 35 and your level is 20, well, maybe 2,000 is enough for you and you'll bring it up to that 35. Well, what if your level is only four? And I've seen this on, on lab tests. This is vitamin D is four, and it's supposed to be 35 or above. Well, that person you might want to have take quite a bit more vitamin D than that. Um, 
get some vitamin D and a good multi, and I think that's always a good place to start. Um, but if, if you really want to know about vitamin D, I'd say get tested. Um, other supplements that are commonly asked about in terms of the science goes is individual vitamins, and, and as a rule, I don't recommend that people take individual vitamins and accept under a doctor's supervision. Uh, there's just too many complicating factors that can happen. Um, the other thing that comes up supplemental-wise is uh, fish oil. Uh, fish oil, you know, there again, you know, if you're eating fish, if you're eating oily fish that has a lot of, of the omega-3 oils in them, then maybe you don't. But most of us don't eat enough of that. And so taking some fish oil supplements, these are some liquid or some capsules, can be helpful. Um, and those are kind of the basic supplements that I think everybody should sort of consider. Now, you also said something about digestion, and then you get into digestive supplements, which are pro prebiotics, probiotics, enzymes, and things like that. Um, you know, we're talking about now here about this elimination process. Well, this elimination process relies on your digestive system working well. So that's why fiber is so important. That's why probiotics and good bacteria are so important. Um, What's the um, lowest number of uh, like the billion that you should take in a program of probiotics? I always get confused. Well, I know like it's, you know, you're, say like 20 or 25 is what I've always been. Make sure it's less like 20 or 25 billion. Those ones are kind of hard to find and I always find like 15. Like, yeah. That would be enough. Well, and one of the reasons it's difficult for you to get a clear answer is because you're looking at a moving target. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started in practice, it was a, it was a big deal to get 10,000 bacteria to somebody. And then it went up to a million, and then it went to a billion. And now I have several different ones. I have a four billion for just regular people, and I have a 25, and I have a 30, and I have a 100 billion for people who are really working to sort of restore their digestive system. And you know, this wasn't all made up just because people wanted to sell more little bacteria. It's because the research is basically saying, wow, we got a lot of bacteria in our bodies, and we're seeing that it's affecting us in so many different ways. You may have seen the recent reports coming out about um, weight loss and our gut bacteria, hormone imbalances, and, and autoimmune disease. There's a lot of research on autoimmune diseases. And that's why when I listed all of those problems of toxins coming into our body, digestion is high on that list for some people. So the other question that comes up about this is, well, can I just eat fermented foods? And for some people, that is fine. And this is what people did for thousands of years. We had fermented foods. We had beer and things and kimchi and sauerkraut and, of course, yogurt and all of these things. The problem is that so much of that now is pasteurized and the good bacteria has been killed off. Though, so they're not really living foods anymore. They don't really give us the good stuff. Um, there's a fad now of people doing their own sort of cultured stuff at home. Um, and for some people that works really well, but I've also seen some people who've had really negative consequences for that too, because you can't always control the kind of bacteria that are in there and, and know if those are the bacteria that you need. Um, the problem with eating yogurt is that while well, most of them have been killed, it's still a very low count, even in the high numbers of, if they do have living bacteria. And the other thing is they're cow bacteria. And so the very best uh, capsules or supplemental bacteria are actually human-derived bacteria, because all animals have their unique bacterial makeup. Um, so. Okay. Probiotics, <laughs> the fermented okay. foods. Um, other questions? Good yes. Question. Okay. Are you familiar with Dr. Schultz? Dr. Schultz? Which one? I don't know, the one who has the huge like supplements business. Oh. It's like a mail order thing. Uh, you don't know. I, yeah. I was hoping you could tell me what it was like. He was a class. Um, because, you know, 
a huge line of supplemental stuff that he, you know, claims would be cure all depending on which one you're looking at. And I've been taking his multivitamin for a while, and it's food based and it has all the good stuff in it. And it seems like it's okay, but I thought maybe you could buy it. Well, yeah, there's so many. There's yeah. kind of just every day people are sending me stuff about these sure. companies. I fortunately can buy lines that are only available to doctors, so we know that they're better quality. But I, you know, I always start with this. You know, yeah. are you really looking at this? And you know, a great example of this is you know who uh, Andrew Weil is. Yeah. He's this holistic MD, and I think he has a lot of integrity. He's learned a lot of good stuff. But he was on 60 Minutes a few years ago, and they were conducting this interview, and you know, pat him on the back and all this. And then they said, oh, by the way, we took your vitamin, because he has his own line of vitamins, and we tested them, and they don't have in them what you say they have in them. Well, obviously, Dr. Wilde doesn't go down to his basement and mix these things up and put them into capsules. He has somebody do it for them, and they weren't following GMP practices. So, you know, I don't know if they were doing that out of negligence, out of you know, trying to save money, uh, if they were actually willfully trying to cheat him or whatever. But anyway, they weren't doing it. And he was, you know, um, you know, astounded by this. So it's really, really important. I, I, another story about this is I, I, I knew these people that had their own supplement line. Um, they're, st they're still around. It's a very good quality supplement line, and they would test everything they got in. Well, they were trying to get um, fish oil because obviously they're not going out and catching the fish and squeezing the oil, right? They're buying it from somebody else. Same thing for B vitamins and everybody, you know, people aren't making these themselves, they're buying them from other people. Well, they would. They would say, okay, we're interested in buying your fish oil, send us a sample. The company would send them a sample, and it wasn't even fish oil. Yeah. It was something really cheap, like, uh, like um, uh, uh, usually it was soy oil or corn oil or some very inexpensive oil. Yeah. So, other questions? Surely you have toxic in your lives. Well, I, I, I did a plan. A few years ago, there was a bee. It's something I got at CCC, and we had to take these tablets a few times a day with water and eat a very light diet. Um, and I did it probably more often than was prescribed. Can you cause yourself intestinal, permanent intestinal damage? Because shortly thereafter, I became very sick and ended up having um, massive deformity deficiency, pernicious anemia. Huh? So I was wondering if you could possibly do it. Yeah. Uh, certainly, possibly. I mean, you know, without knowing the specifics of what was in it, but you know, do you think it was more of a cleanse for the detox? It was more of a clay and maybe a little laxative or something like that in there that it seemed to really have detoxification component, antioxidants, and sulfur compounds. I don't really remember yeah. the mostly simple. Yeah. It, 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 it was tablet based. Yeah. And, well, I don't remember exactly what was in it. But as I said, I think they wanted me to do it like once every change of seasons, and I was doing it like for kids to cram. It was weight and everything. So, you know, I was months and, you know, I got really sick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it gets even, it gets so complicated, you know, and I. Jumping back to genetics for a minute. You know, one of the great things we've been finding out by doing people's genetics is finding out that there are some people who are, don't process sulfur very well. So this is what a paradox. We need sulfur to detoxify, and yet some people genetically don't process sulfur, break it down and get rid of it very well. So if you were, for instance, doing some kind of program where there was a lot of sulfur and you have this genetic weakness, it could have thrown you into crisis, yeah. Now there's ways to get around that. We would never say to people, don't, you know, avoid sulfur. For one reason, it's impossible. The second reason is because you need it. But you might be careful about excessive amounts of sulfur and then do other things to open up those pathways to help your body process the sulfur better.
So I can see a possibility of that. And then the other possibility is there, there, there was a lot of clay in there yeah. that can take out the B12 and some of the nutrients as it's taking out the toxins too, yeah. that you're not, especially if you were sort of already kind of marginal there. Right. Um, so it's certainly possible. And that's, that's why, you know, I know I'm prejudiced because I, you know, that's my job is to do detoxes on people and to see them. And so, of course, I want people to come to me. But I see so many people who are at the very least wasting their money and often hurting themselves by doing what they think is good stuff because it was recommended on a website or they saw it on a jar at PCC or something like that. And, uh, and of course, always follow the direction. <laughs> uh, anything else? I think our time is pretty good here. Yes? What about anemic people? What about them? <laughs> yeah. We should do something about them. <laughs> there should be a camp. I just, I just, I'm just, you know, poor person and a poor world, and I just want to know about the anemic people. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. Like, Why are they anemic? I've been diagnosed with anemic people. I have anemic people. I don't think it's true. Well, or like iron deficiency. Well, I, I, so I earlier I misspoke when I said vitamin B was one of the few nutrients you could test accurately. Iron is a good one too. You can test very accurately if you have enough iron. So if a person is iron deficient, which is the most common, there's different kinds of anemia, that's the most common, and you go, okay, why don't you have enough iron in your body? And so first you got to just go backwards and you say, well, what's going on with your diet? Are you eating iron-rich fruit? Are you having beets? Are you having, you know, basically meat is the highest in iron. And then, are you digesting it? Digest the gastrointestinal tract. You know, if you feel like, gee, I'm, I'm eating a lot of meat, I'm getting a lot of iron-rich foods, then you got to question whether you know, you're not digesting it very well and actually absorbing that iron. Now, women have the additional problem is it's always an intake and loss thing. So if you're having really heavy cycles, you know, heavy menstrual cycles, you could be losing. You could, this could all be working just fine, but if you have a hormonal imbalance and you're having really heavy periods, you could be losing it. Lots of women go to the passive period. Right. Well, this gets us back. Do you remember I was talking down here about all of the things that the toxins can do? And one of them is to throw off hormones. You know, and this is, this is one of the things that I really want to emphasize, that so many women think that it's normal to be homicidal, suicidal, and uh, whatever other kind of suicidal every month. <laughs> And that's absolutely wrong. But we, we, we live in a society where, oh, well, that's just the way you are. And you have head injuries, <laughs> and they're irregular. And just take a pill. But those are all a sign of hormonal imbalances. And those can be fixed. Not just fixed by taking uh, estrogen, which increases your risk of cancer, but by actually fixing your body so that it works well. Um, but you're iron deficient. There's something going on here. Did I give you the thyroid example last time? Yeah. Not so, just to reiterate this idea to put these two lectures with nutrition and detoxification together, you know, we could be talking about any system in the body. But we're going to take thyroid as just one system and we're going to say, here's the brain, it's monitoring the body. It's sending a message to the thyroid gland. It says, oh, you need more or less thyroid. And that gets turned into thyroid. And that thyroid goes to every cell in your body. It goes to your muscles. It goes to your metabolism, so it affects your weight. It goes to your skin. You're going to see people with low thyroid who have terrible skin and hair. Um, 
its capability to digest the system so people tend to be constipated and have digestive problems if they're not getting enough thyroid hormone. So again, you always want to go through this process of going, okay, what happens here if somebody's low in thyroid? Where's the weakness here? Well, the thyroid gland makes thyroid from iodine and certain amino acids and zinc and other nutrients. So if you're deficient in any of those, your thyroid's not going to do a very good job. And how do you get those? Well, they have to be in your, they have to be in your diet and you have to be digesting those things in order for this to work. Uh, I mentioned earlier about vitamin D. Vitamin D and the omega-3 oils are necessary for your thyroid gland to get out and send its message. If it's, if it's trying to alert your ovaries that it needs more estrogen, it's not going to do a good job of that if there isn't vitamin D there. So my point being, there's a number of places that this could go wrong nutritionally. And there's also some places where it can go on toxicity. We know that certain toxins block these pathways to help the thyroid make these things. So we can look at somebody and say, gee, they're eating a great diet, they're digesting their diet, but they've got these thyroid problems. Maybe they've got something going on toxic-wise that is blocking this pathway. And like I said at the beginning, you, you can use this same pathway overview to any process in your body. You know, there's a lot of emphasis um, um, on depression, on serotonin. So a person's depressed, they don't sleep very well. Uh, serotonin also affects your digestion, so sort of it can mess up. So if you're low in serotonin, you just want to take Prozac, which helps, you know, increase your serotonin level, or you want to figure out what's going on here, you go backwards and you say, well, you need this certain proteins, amino acids, to make the serotonin, which means you have to be eating some protein, which means you have to be digesting that protein in your gastrointestinal tract, and then it doesn't just magically convert into serotonin, there are some enzymes here, and those enzymes depend on B vitamins and zinc and this stuff called folate, which is particularly under the control of certain genes. So if you have a genetic problem, you can have some problems with these. So there's a number of reasons why somebody can be nutritionally be deficient in serotonin. They can also have a block in this pathway because there's too much plastic or lead or other toxins going on. They've been finding plastic in people's bodies since the Vietnam War. So this is, this is known hormone disruption. But it also disrupts serotonin, all sorts of other things. So my point being, in summary, that's why we're looking at nutrition. That's why we're looking at detoxification. These are the two things that have changed the most in the last 150 years. There's direct correlation with these things with all of our chronic diseases. And that's where we need to be focusing our, our treatment options. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.